today I'm going to talk about how to grow sweet potatoes. But before we get started, I'm going to update you on how the rest of our garden's been doing since our last episode. We've planted over the course of the last, um, let's see, March, April, May, uh, three and a half months. We started, some of the stuff we actually planted the garlic before the original February freeze. Um, and, um, and this guy we planted before the freeze and it's, it's just getting started. <laughs> the tomatoes we didn't plant until um, late, like early April. Um, the carrots we planted in uh, February and we're still, we're really disappointed by the carrots. They have not done much of anything. Uh, the lettuce we planted in the early spring as well. Um, the okra we just planted a couple of weeks ago. That's in the back there. Uh, and same with the squashes, we just recently planted those. So um, this has been a series that we've been doing through the spring. On uh, each, uh, every couple of weeks, we've had a class on what to do this week kind of thing. And then this is the result of what we've been doing over the course of the series. Some stuff we've actually ripped out because it wasn't doing well. And rather than trying to nurse it along, we just ripped it out and planted something else. Are these carrots over here? Those are more carrots over there. They're, they're just not performing. Yeah, they're, uh, the ones that we've pulled are still really small. Uh, the lettuce is about done. Uh, it's starting to, I can see a grasshopper there right now. Um, but you can see how this one has become like kind of tall and, and that means it's getting ready to bolt. But I've been, there was a whole bunch of lettuce in here originally and I've been harvesting it throughout the spring and using it on my salads at lunchtime. And so I've had fresh, freshly harvested uh, uh, butter lettuce and the uh, red, red leaf lettuce, arugula, uh, some other mixed greens that we had growing in here. I've been harvesting those uh, during the whole, the whole season and eating those for my lunch. Uh, and then eventually we're going to have tomatoes. The tomatoes are just now starting to set fruit. Uh, that one is a sweet 100. And we just sprayed that one. It looks like it's got spider mites. So we just sprayed all of the tomato plants with neem oil to treat the spider mites. But that's already set some fruit. This one has a couple of down here that have already uh, started to grow. This one is a Cherokee purple. So it's going to have, when it's mature, it's actually going to be purple inside and out instead of red like a regular tomato, but it's a really meaty variety. It's great for slicing. We're talking about how to grow sweet potatoes and we're all gonna, everything I tell you is gonna be how to do it the organic way. Sweet potatoes are a warm season uh, crop. Normally, you would start them in like April or May early May um, because they're very slow growing. They take up to 110 days uh, from planting the slips until harvest. And so you need a very long warm season to grow them, which is why they're, they're generally thought of as a southern vegetable. Now they've developed um, varieties that will do best better up north uh, that, you know that are more faster maturing and whatnot so that you can grow them up north as well but um, the south is really where most sweet potatoes come from and in fact Texas is the fifth largest sweet potato grower in the nation and one of the reasons they do so well here is besides being a warm season crop they're or because they're a warm season crop I should say they're very heat tolerant and they're very drought tolerant. Um, you don't need to water them very much. And in fact, if you water them too much, they'll rot in the ground. So we're going to talk more about that as we go along. Uh, but that's, um, that's an important point about sweet potatoes. Um, sweet potatoes are not the same thing as yams. Most people use those words interchangeably, but they're really two different types of root vegetables. 
Um, they're in a completely different genus from sweet potatoes. Uh, and they're also in a completely different genus from uh, these potatoes that we had growing over here, which w actually we already harvested our potatoes, uh, but those were Idaho or russet potatoes. They go by a couple of different names, but they're a different genus and species from the sweet potatoes. Um, sweet potatoes, mostly, uh, at least the original, you know, heirloom varieties are orange in color, but they can come in um, white, purple, yellow, um, actually a lot of different colors, and there are hundreds of different varieties. The orange fleshed ones happen to be high in beta carotene, so like carrots, they're very good for your eyes actually to eat the beta carotene um, but flesh color is just one of the reasons you'd want to you know choose a variety to grow um, and then really more important is how many days to maturity because like I said you need to have a frost free growing season that lasts for at least 110 days and so uh, like I said, for us, that usually means starting them in April or, or early May, but because we've had such a cool uh, spring and so much rain, as I mentioned, they can rot in the ground if they get too much water. So I think even though we're technically starting late, that this is still a very good time to plant. And so uh, that's why we rescheduled this class for now instead of postponing it because the original date was rained out. Um, and uh, so we're going to go ahead and plant them now. And um, given 110 days to maturity, which these are all going to be not exactly 110, each variety is a little bit different, but um, assuming 110 days, that would put us in mid-September. And that's still plenty warm enough for Texas. So um, uh, I would think that you could um, actually grow two crops, uh, starting some in April, say, in a normal season, and then starting some more in June or whatever, and, and then having more of a succession harvest rather than having to harvest them all at once. Um, you don't really need to worry too much about succession planting though with sweet potatoes because they do keep for a long time if you cure them properly. So they can last up to a year if you, if you cure them properly. Uh, some of the choices that are good for North Texas, and like I said, there are hundreds of varieties. These are not the only ones that are good for our area, but these are the ones that we have in stock right now. Um, this one is, I'm going to start with the, whoops, the Georgia Jet is, um, this one here is a Georgia Jet. They all look the same, really. Uh, the Georgia Jet is a uh, faster growing. It, it supposedly reaches maturity in about 90 days rather than 110. So if you're in more of a hurry, if your growing season is a little shorter, this would be a good variety to grow. Beauregard is uh, longer, takes a little bit longer. It's more like 100 to 110 days. The Beauregard has a reddish to light purple color rather than a bright orange like some of the other ones do. The, um, and the, the Georgia Jet has orange flesh. The Verdana, which is what this one is, called Verdana. And this one is great for people who have really small gardens. This one can actually grow in a pot. Uh, the thing about sweet potatoes is that if you've ever grown the, the ornamental variety, you know they spread like crazy. They just go everywhere. And um, the plant, the edible varieties do the same thing. They spread like crazy on the ground. They're, they're a, really a ground covering vine, if you will. And um, the, every place that they touch the ground, they'll put down another root and that will create another, another vegetable, another root vegetable there. Um, the Verdana is, is 
uh, the exception to that, one of the exceptions to that. This particular variety does not put down a root when it spreads. So it can be grown in a container. Now you're obviously gonna get a smaller crop because you're not gonna be able to let it spread and, and um, you know, create more plants as you go. But you can, if you, you know, if you just have a patio or something, a patio garden, this would be the variety that you would want to grow. Let's see, I already said they're well adapted to um, heat and drought. They're likewise, because most plants can't be both heat tolerant and cold tolerant. Um, up to a point, yes, there's, you know, there's a, a window that most plants fit into depending on what they are exactly. But, um, you know, if you're in a warm season window, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to tolerate like sub-zero temperatures, like at least not, it's not very likely. And we got to find that out this spring. <laughs> a lot of stuff didn't make it through our, our snowmageddon because we're not used to having temperatures that cold. Um, so anyway, um, sweet potatoes are not considered to be cold tolerant, which is why they're grown mainly in the south where it doesn't usually freeze in the winter and so on. Um, the, they cannot tolerate anything below about a soil temperature of about 55 degrees. So once the temperature drops below that, um, the plants are gonna die. And um, you need to harvest them before they get to that point because you don't want them to actually freeze. They can tolerate a light frost, but they can't tolerate a freeze. So if you don't harvest them before that happens, you're basically, you're gonna lose your crop. One odd fact I discovered about sweet potatoes is that um, while most of us, especially here in the summertime, if we're gonna go out and garden, we wanna do that early in the morning when it's cool, right? Well, sweet potatoes, for some reason, prefer to be planted in the afternoon. Uh, kind of, you know, it didn't explain why, <laughs> just that they seem to do better if you plant them in the afternoon when the soil is, is warmest and, um, you know, they just take off better that way. So you might want to make an exception for your sweet potatoes and hold off planting them until this afternoon or tomorrow afternoon if you're going to be doing it this weekend. They are different from other vegetables as well because most vegetables you grow from a starter plant. You know, you get your little pot with your plant in it and it's already got the roots and some soil and you transfer that to the ground. Sweet potatoes are grown from what's called a slip. And a slips are cuttings that have been taken from an existing plant and then you put these in water and, and let them grow roots like these have. And you want the roots to be about three inches long before you take them out to plant. Uh, as you can see, these were wrapped in, in um, soaking in water and wrapped up so that they could be bundled. But if you're not gonna plant them right away, uh, you wanna leave them in this bundle and keep it moist until you're ready to plant because you want to keep those roots moist. Yes, ma'am. Do we still have slips for sale? Yes, we do still have slips for sale. Thank you for the question. Um, we do. We have a whole bunch of these in the, um, in the greenhouse in the vegetable department. We have the three varieties, the Georgia Jet, the Verdana, and the um, and Beauregard. Thank you. Bunches, so, there's 25 in a bunch, by the way. They, uh, each bunch has 25 slips in it. So that's, that's a lot of sweet potatoes. When you consider that these are gonna vine and put down more roots each time they touch the ground, uh, 25 slips, you could grow, you know, like an acre's worth of, of sweet potatoes with 25 slips. So that, that's quite a bit. Um, and again, the, the exception would be the, the um, uh, Verdana, which you would grow in a pot. Yes, ma'am. So if, if I have a raised garden and it's, say, four feet by six feet, could I put, given that there's like 25, 
Mm -hmm. slips in there. Could I get the Verdana, the one that you can grow on a pipe, and put several of them down, and, and technically, because they don't reseed themselves, I mean, on the plant, I would have 20,000 plants. Yes. Could I, could I put them like that? So, mm -hmm. in order to use, utilize the full bundle, I'm trying to figure out how it optimize, mm -hmm. not wasting any of them, because I just don't have that much. I have about a, a maybe an eight foot by four foot raised Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the question uh, for our Facebook audience is um, how to maximize your number of slips if you have a raised bed or something like that. Can you take the Verdana variety that doesn't uh, continuously root and plant 25 of those in a row? And you certainly could do that. What you can't do is, is save the slips indefinitely. So they have to get planted uh, otherwise, they're they're eventually gonna just give out rot, die, whatever. Um, but yes, um, and one thing about them is because they do spread so much, uh, you don't want to plant these too close together. You want to give them the space they need to spread out and put down those those secondary roots. Um, so you need to plant them fairly far apart, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Anyway, uh, you want to you want to plant in a sunny location. You need at least six hours of full sun. That's what what we mean when we say full sun in Texas, because 16 hours <laughs> of full sun can be pretty harsh, even for a sweet potato. Um, if you get uh, if you can give them some afternoon shade. If they're out in the full sun all day long, um, you know, even they're gonna droop a little bit, they'll be okay, but they would prefer some afternoon shade just so that they're not broiling in that late afternoon, 100 plus degree temperatures in, in, that we get in July and August. Um, another thing I wanted to say about slips before I go on is that uh, if you look at these, you'll see, if you look up close, you'll see some are yellow. If you smell them, you'll, you'll gag. Um, they smell like they're rotting. They turn yellow and whatnot. There's nothing to be concerned about with those. That's normal for the slips to do that. So if, if they look like, you know, a few of these leaves are dying or whatever, don't worry about it. Uh, don't worry about the smell or anything like that. They're perfectly fine and ready to plant. Like I said, they need lots of room to spread. Um, and a mature sweet potato is gonna be uh, pretty big. It's gonna be about four to six inches long and two or three inches wide. And so um, that's why you don't wanna plant them too close together. Okay, his question was, um, if you want to start your own slips, uh, sweet potato slips, you need to um, take the cutting, put it in the water and let it sit. It can take several weeks for it to develop. You want the roots to be about three inches long before you plant. So um, it's going to take at least a couple of weeks for them to develop roots that long. Uh, it's going to vary depending on the variety, how long it takes for them to do that. Uh, but you really just want to keep an eye on them and, and uh, see how how big the roots are before you take them out and plant them. Each uh, each slip can make several potatoes, so um, you should be able to get about four pounds worth of potatoes out of each slip. Even if you're doing what you were talking about, just planting one um, non you know non um, uh, rooting type variety you should be able to get about four pounds of sweet potatoes from that single slip. So soil, back to soil, I keep trying to talk about that. Soil is extremely important because this is a root vegetable. It needs to have really, really loose, uncompacted soil for those tubers to be able to expand into the, uh, you know, into the form of a potato. Um, our uh, potatoes, we harvested our regular potatoes, Idaho potatoes already. We got a bunch of potatoes, but they were still really small. And I think that was because of all the rain we got. Um, there wasn't enough um, 
Uh, it also, the rain compacted down the, the dirt in the containers uh, and, and, um, and we just didn't get enough dry, sunny weather for them to really develop properly, which is why I think it's a good thing for, that we're waiting until now to plant our sweet potatoes because otherwise we're probably gonna have the same problem. The other reason you want to have really loose soil is because you need to have really good drainage because again you don't want them sitting in water. Uh, in fact it's not a good idea to fertilize them during the growing season because especially uh, with nitrogen because nitrogen fuels top growth. Not Another important point growth. about sweet potatoes is and they don't so, need very much fertilization. Um, and what you want is the tubers to grow. You want the soil to be loose. You don't want to have to fertilize it. So if you're planting in, what we did over here was I took some of the raised bed mix, which is a ready to plant in soil that we sell by the bag. I just made a mound there, two mounds actually, in our bed over here because that's never been used before it's fresh compost it's it's nice and rich and ready to plant in i'm not going to fertilize my slips at all i'm just going to plant directly into the composted uh, raised bed mix uh, if you happen to have soil that's that's uh, crappy you know the best thing to do would be to compost it uh, and um, if you wanted to, you could use a little bit of fertilizer at planting time uh, and incorporate that into the soil that you're using. But be careful not to keep on fertilizing and especially not to use, if you are gonna fertilize, use a, um, use a phosphate, a high phosphate fertilizer, low nitrogen, high, higher in phosphate because the nitrogen is for top growth, phosphate is for root development. And like we said, we don't want the top growth. We want roots. So uh, it's best just to leave them alone. Um, even if you're planting in ground, according to Texas A&M, our soils already have enough phosphate and potassium in them to, uh, to grow sweet potatoes without fertilization. The other thing too is that um, you need, I mounded these because you need to have a deep, area for them to uh, grow in. They're going to go down about 8 to 12 inches before they start to form their tubers. And um, we're growing on concrete, so you know they can only go down so far. So that's why I mounted it up to make sure that they have enough depth to go down as far as they need to to form those tubers. So you know, you can't plant in, in a shallow, shallow container like you can with the ornamental variety. Um, and by the way, that, that reminds me of a question I get asked a lot about sweet potato vines, the ornamental vines that we sell is, you know, can you eat those? And um, technically they're edible, but no one wants to because same kind of tuber uh, that the edible variety does and they're tough and taste bad. So yes, you can eat them, but don't. Don't bother, grow the edible kind if you wanna eat them. When you start them, however, you do need to keep the slips moist until they get established. So the first couple weeks, you are gonna need to check them pretty much every day and, and probably water them, especially if we start getting warmer weather um, because there's not that much to these roots yet. You know, they're still pretty small. These are going to need some time to, to really get down into the soil and, and uh, become established. So make sure you keep them moist when you first put them in for the first two weeks. And then, um, and don't tug on them because you'll just pull them out. Uh, so just leave them uh, moist and then back off on your watering after that so that they're not getting too wet. Yes, the question is, so after they're established, how often should you water? Uh, they need about one inch of water per week. And that includes rainfall. So, um, you know, lately we've been getting more than that fr just from rain. You know, right now I'm more concerned about overwatering 
them than I would be about under them. Um, they can go dry for, they are, like I said, drought tolerant, so they can go for a while without water and be okay. Also remember too that the top is gonna dry out really fast. You're gonna look at the top of the soil and say, oh my gosh, it's all dried out, but eight inches, 12 inches down, it's still gonna be moist for a long time. It takes a while for the soil to dry out at that depth and uh, you don't wanna overwater. So I always check my, uh, my soil before I water. You can get a soil uh, moisture meter that you can put into the soil to check if you want to do it that way. I just use my finger and, you know, feel down in there. And if I can stick my finger all the way down in there and it still feels moist, then I know I don't need to water yet. And that's true for most of your vegetables. Um, most of us overwater. And overwatering is, um, more harmful to your plants than underwatering. And this is a general rule for, your, for all of your plants, um, especially Texas natives, because they're adapted to this climate. Water no more than once a week um, and water deeply when you do water. So put down that, that full inch of water and then leave it until the next week. And if it turns out that you underwatered it, it's going to be okay. If, whereas if you overwater it, the roots are going to rot, the plant's going to die. And uh, plants cannot recover from overwatering as easily as they can from underwatering. So again, if you're not sure whether to water or not, um, stick your hand down in there or get a moisture meter and, and check because you don't want to rot those tubers. So the question was, um, should I, if I have an in-ground garden that, that's already really deep, do I still need to mound my soil? And the answer is no. I mounded the soil because I don't have a deep uh, space. I have a raised bed on concrete. And so I need to make extra sure that the, that the plants have enough, enough room to grow downward. So that's why I mounded it. Um, some people mound it just because they don't want to have to compost their bed as much. It's, you know, because it's a lot of work to get in there and till it and turn it over and work in the compost and everything. Uh, so that's a way to get them started. Uh, but if you don't have loose soil underneath that mound, Again, your roots aren't going to develop properly, so you still want to make sure that, that what's underneath the mound is, is nice and loose. The uh, spacing between the slips should be about 12 to 18 inches. And they're going to fill in really fast. Once they get established, those vines are going to take off. Um, and until they get established, and eventually they're going to cover the soil, so you don't need to mulch because the vines are going to cover the soil anyway. Uh, but until you do, you want to try to keep it weed free because you don't want the, the weeds to get established in there. Uh, so just keep it weeded until the um, sweet potatoes have filled in. And then you shouldn't really have to do very much maintenance at all other than watering and waiting for it to grow. It's really a pretty easy crop to grow. You're supposed to have three to four feet between the rows if you're doing row planting. Uh, and I don't think that's three to four feet, but that's okay. Uh, like I said, fertilization, you don't really need to do anything. Once you've planted them, they should be good to go. And, um, and then just water and weed. Very, very important. About three to four weeks before you harvest them, you want to stop watering altogether because um, the if they start to get too big or whatever uh, and you water them they'll split and you don't want them to split so um, you need to mark your calendar for uh, three to four weeks before they're due to be mature so if it's 110 days to maturity it would be, you know, in our case, we're talking about mid-September would be harvest time. So 
three weeks prior to that, we would stop watering. So about the middle of August, we'll stop watering them all together. And that's really um, about all there is to growing them. Um, you know, when they are ready, you can do a test dig if you want to, to see how big the tubers are before you pull them out. Um, you can do that with any type of, of root vegetable. You can just do a test dig uh, and on one of them to see how it's doing and leave the rest alone. Um, if it looks like it's ready to harvest and it's close to the number of days to maturity, then you can go ahead and pull them. Uh, if they look like they still need to develop some more, then you just, you know, uh, leave the rest in the ground and don't disturb them for another week or so. And then, you know, and you can do as many test digs as you feel like you need to. Uh, pests and diseases. Um, if you're growing in the ground, you're more likely to have problems, actually, if you're growing in the ground than if you're doing a raised bed or a container because there are, there are more ways for critters to get to your crop. Um, and uh, especially with sweet potato um, and really any kind of root vegetable, um, one problem we have a lot of around here is moles. Moles are just, oh, they're horrible. And we have a lot of them around here. And um, they're very hard to get to. So, you know, moles live underground. You don't see them. You don't necessarily know that they're even there until they've already wrecked havoc on your garden, you know. And they tunnel underneath. They're, they're actually there to eat insects. They're not really there to disturb your, your vegetables. They're looking for earthworms and grubs and, and stuff like that. But in the process, they tear everything up and you know, bruise your, bruise your plants, leave holes, uh, leave roots hanging. You know, I've had that happen with my flowers where, you know, my annual flowers are, you wonder why it's wilting and then you realize there's somebody's tunneled underneath it and, you know, the roots are just hanging in the air. There's, they're not in soil anymore. And that's the kind of damage that moles can do and they can, uh, it's a little harder for them to get into a raised bed, especially since we're on concrete. We don't really have to worry about moles. But you do if you have any kind of uh, land on your property. If you live in a house, you're going to have moles. Um, and this is an organic way to repel them. This is basically castor bean oil in a granular carrier. That's The carrier itself is inert. It's totally safe for pets, people. It is castor oil and castor oil will, you know, help you have a bowel movement. So if, if your dog were to get into this and, and actually ingest a bunch of it, it would, it would upset their stomach, but it wouldn't kill them or anything like that. And certainly once you're sprinkling it on the ground, um, it's, you know, it's gonna be hard it's, it's going to stick to the ground. It's going to go into the ground. You're going to water this in anyway. So it's going to dissolve into the soil. So once it's down, it's, it's totally harmless for people and pets. Uh, but what it does is it makes the, the mole's food sources taste like castor oil. And it doesn't taste good and it upsets their stomach the same way it upsets ours. So it tends to drive them away and they tend to go look somewhere else. It doesn't kill them. It's uh, yeah. He asked if uh, if they ate the uh, mole scram, would it would it cause uh, uh, the runs? And uh, it possibly, possibly, but it's not designed to kill them. It's designed to repel them. And uh, it's but it's very easy to put out, and then you just water it in, and it keeps working for I think uh, 30 days or so, depending on how much rain and whatnot you get. Um, does come with a hundred percent guarantee, but this container will do uh, a little over 3,000 square feet. So you don't need a whole lot of it either. Uh, but so that will repel moles. Uh, you're still left with other small mammals like rats and mice and, and squirrels. 
squirrels are terrible. They'll dig everything up and eat it. Uh, and we do have a squirrel repellent uh, that we sell as well. Uh, another thing you can do to repel mammals and um, other random critters. I don't know if an armadillo is considered a mammal or not. Um, but one way to repel other, other critters is to use uh, predator urine. We sell both fox urine and coyote urine. And uh, what it does is, you, you know, when you put it out, it's, uh, it's the real thing. And so it smells like there's a predator nearby. And, uh, and that will, you know, essentially scare them away. And they'll, they'll say, I don't want to hang around here because I might get eaten by a coyote. So I'm going to go. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. just, Have you tried the coyote urine? No. Okay. Think that's Some animals are um, are easily frightened by the fox urine. Some are not. Uh, some of the bigger ones, like raccoons, are pretty big. They're they're as big as a fox, so they're not going to be as afraid. They're not going to want to get into a fight with a fox, but. Uh, they're not as afraid of a fox as they would be a, of a coyote. Um, so sometimes you need to use the other one. Um, we actually have a chart inside the store that tells you which one to use for what type of critter you're repelling. Um, and there is a little bit of difference there. Squirrels are going to be afraid of both foxes and coyotes. Um, so if one doesn't work, I would try the other, but there, it's easy to put out because all you need to do is, uh, get these little plastic bottles. Each one of these has a cotton ball inside of it and, uh, you can just squirt. There's holes in, in the side of the, um, uh, plastic here where you can squirt urine onto the cotton ball. Hang this plastic. Thing around your garden. Um, each one of these will cover about 100 square feet, so you might want to have several of them. The, the package comes with three in there, uh, but you can also buy these separately. For some reason, the Coyote one doesn't have the, the package. You just get the, the bottle and then you have to buy the plastic bottles separately. Um, yeah, whether it would attract them or not, I really, I couldn't say for sure. Uh, certainly a possibility um, when they're making their rounds at night to, um, you know, one of the things that both, I mean, even dogs and cats, you know, domestic dogs and cats, when they go outside, one of the things that they do is like kind of do a patrol of their yard to go sniff around and see who's been here. and you know, and, and that sort of thing. And so they may do that kind of behavior, come into your yard to, to sniff around and see if it's a male or a female and are they still present, that sort of thing. But um, uh, hopefully you're not, your animals aren't out when they're, you know, I always bring my animals in, inside at night because of that, because that's usually when these creatures are out and they're, um, you know, it's uh, not 100% safe to leave them out during the day, but it's certainly less likely during the day than it, it would be at night for them to, to be attacked. Um, but your garden, you know, um, is basically open 24 seven. So <laughs> it's up to you what method you use, you know, but um, sometimes there's really not a lot you can do. And um, I encourage, uh, especially since we're organic, uh, I encourage you all to, um, to make space for these creatures in your gardens because um, we've taken their land away from them. They don't have any other place to go. And, uh, you know, it just keeps getting worse for them as we develop, as Texas, you know, grows in population and we spread out more and more there's fewer and fewer places for these animals to live. 
and um, you know they don't have any choice but but to try to find food and whatnot in our backyards and um, I know we don't want to lose our pets and we don't want to lose our our plants to them uh, but at the same time you know they don't really have an alternative and um, uh, some of them are actually endangered so that's really the the main problems with um, as far as uh, animals go there's not a lot of insect issues with root vegetables you um, basically you don't really care what happens to the top if grasshoppers come along and and nibble on your on your sweet potato vines as long as they don't eat too much of it and leave enough top growth to um, to protect the soil uh, it's not really harmful to allow insects if you are worried about it uh, we have organic products like neem oil and, and stuff that you can spray the vines with are those tubers and there aren't um, uh, a whole lot of insects that that attack tubers like that there is a thing called a root knot nematode uh, I have not run into it very much here uh, but this is a nematode an organic nematode control basically this would be a soil drench because you want to get down to the root level the other things you can get are uh, flea beetles cutworms weevils things like that uh, again, anything on the top growth um, isn't really, uh, unless you have a major infestation, uh, we've got grasshoppers really bad right now, um, and I've been trying to kill those just by hand, but that's really hard. Um, there's not a lot that will control grasshoppers uh, because they're, they're just, yeah, they're really big and tough, and um, they're just hard to kill. Uh, flea beetles and stuff like that you can spray with the neem or with our organicide uh, three-in-one be safe uh, which is a sesame oil based product um, the uh, other thing would be pill bugs you can use um, the sluggo plus kills both slugs and snails as well as um, sow bugs pill bugs whatever the name is you use for those little roly-poly things you sprinkle the Sluggo Plus on the soil. It's a bait and uh, it's little like rice pellet looking things, white little uh, pellets that you sprinkle on the ground. It, the um, uh, pill bugs eat the bait and kills them. If your sweet potatoes are just getting established and you're seeing stuff on them, yeah, um, do something you know, treat it, whatever it, whatever the issue is. If it's slugs, put this out. Uh, you know, if it's grasshoppers, you can try spraying them with neem oil, but you have to spray the grasshopper. Uh, it works better when they're in the nymph stage, which right now they are. All the ones I've seen are still little tiny green ones. Once they mature, they get really long and they turn kind of yellowish color. Once they're it's like nuclear holocaust isn't going to kill them. They're just impossible. They're like cockroaches of the garden. Last section to talk about is how to harvest them. That's a ways off, obviously. And as we go through our series here, we'll update you on, um, you know, how to do that. As ours mature, we'll show you how we harvest ours. But in the meantime, you want to watch for the, the tops to start turning yellow. And that's an indication that they're, that they're getting close to harvest time. And that would be about when you would want to maybe do a test dig if you weren't sure and uh, see if it's ready to actually pull or not. And then finally, curing. Your, your sweet potatoes have to be cured. And, and this is another thing that's very important. Um, you have to cure sweet potatoes so that they will be sweet. If you, uh, like with regular uh, Idaho potatoes, you can eat those freshly harvested if you want to. You can cure them or not. Uh, with sweet potatoes, uh, they won't be sweet unless you cure them first. So that's a very important step you don't want to skimp on. Um, the uh, drying process transforms the starches into sugars. 
So uh, when you first harvest them, you want to lay them on the ground, like we could just lay them out here on the concrete or on, the, on your grass or whatever for uh, about um, two to three hours and uh, so that they're not you know, wet on the outside. And, um, and then move them to a uh, warm, dark place. Uh, well, it doesn't have to be dark, but not out in the bright sun, inside somewhere. Uh, move them inside for another eight to 10 days and uh, let them sit. Um, and then uh, you may see some bruises or discoloration. Don't worry about it. Just let them dry. They should heal themselves and, um, and they should be fine to eat once they're cured, okay? Uh, the other thing is um, just keep them in a dry location. You don't wanna put them in the refrigerator or in a root cellar yet. Best place would just be like on your, really on your kitchen counter where they still get some sunlight uh, but not direct sun. As far as how long they'll keep goes, I got a couple of different uh, answers depending on the source. Some say they will last for, you know, like three or four months. Um, other people say they'll keep for up to a year. Do they need to be laid out or do, can they be piled up in a box or something? Um, I would say that you would want to spread them out because they are very easily bruised and damaged. Uh, the skin is very, very uh, tender and prone to, um, you know, cuts and, and bruises. And you don't want that if you can avoid it. So, uh, in fact, um, in one of the examples I read, they said even if you, you know, if you're pulling them out of the ground and then throwing them into a bucket, you can bruise them just by doing that. So I would spread them out and also you don't want like when they first come out of the ground they're going to be moist. One of the things you're trying to do is get that water to evaporate out of them and if they're touching I would think it would be kind of like with oranges. If oranges are touching and there's any kind of moisture it forms a mold there and then it's it, there's no reason there's no hurry in getting the dirt off of them. Um, they don't care. Yeah, so I would say let them cure first before you tried to rub the dirt off just so you don't damage the, the outer skin. And then after they're finally finished curing, after the eight to 10 days of drying process, you can move them to a cooler, darker place. Uh, they say try to keep them at about 50 to 60 degrees, so not in the refrigerator. Um, and uh, not any place where they would get wet. This is Texas, and they were growing sweet potatoes here long before there was air conditioning. So that's just a guideline. All right, well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming out today. Really appreciate your time.